We live in a world where we're impressed by our own accomplishments. We build huge skyscrapers. We build airplanes that fly through the sky. We build spaceships that explore planets. It's easy to fall into the trap of self-reliance. We admire our own capabilities. And we admire our dominion over nature, our ability to create. We forget often too easily where our true power lies. As humans made in God's image, blessed with intellect and creativity, we can begin to think that the source of our strength is within ourselves. Brothers and sisters, the root of this problem here is pride. The subtle belief that we can manage on our own, that we are in control. This pride blinds us to the reality of our dependency on God. When we forget that we're fully dependent on God for all that we have and all that we can do, then we forget to fully trust in his presence and his power when the hard times come. When the storms of this life show up, we can become fearful. When the weight of this world is pushing on us, our strength can fail. We are not invincible, and we are not all-powerful. When faced with challenges, whether physical difficulties, emotional struggles, or spiritual warfare, we, as people, can be defeated. However, our God, the creator of the universe, he never fails, and he does not lose. He holds all power. He holds all victory in his hands. There is no situation where the God of the universe is not victorious. He wins always and without exception. Today, we'll dig into Isaiah 41, verses 10 through 13, as was just read, and we'll explore the commands. We'll consider the reasons that he gives for the commands and we'll examine the promises that God gives his people. And through this, we'll discover that the victory belongs to God in every situation. Now, God is telling his people here, do not fear. I am with you. He says, I will help you. I will uphold you. Now, before we dive into the specifics, it's important to understand the context. Isaiah prophesied during a difficult time in the history of God's people. They were facing threats from enemies. They were also dealing with internal rebellion and disobedience. Isaiah was also warning the people of the Babylonian captivity, which would take place in the very near future. Now, in the midst of these challenges, God, through Isaiah the prophet, he reassures his people of his presence and his protection. And this message was not only for Israel, but for all who trust in the Lord. Now let's begin with the commands found in these verses. These commands are not only, they're not suggestions. They are divine imperatives given by our loving and powerful God. So in verse 10, we read, do not fear. This is a command. Do not be dismayed or do not anxiously look about you. And in verse 13, do not fear. In the Old Testament, you find this exact wording, do not fear, 50 times. God is constantly telling his people not to be afraid. And there's a lot that we can fear in this life, isn't there? We can fear the unknown. 
We can fear failure, rejection, physical harm. We can be afraid of loneliness. Or we can have spiritual doubts. Now there is only one emotion stronger than fear. And that is love. We're told in 1 John, beginning in verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Our God has nothing to fear. God is love, and those who abide in God have nothing to fear. Now, please mark your Bibles to Isaiah. We're going to head over to the book of Exodus, but you can turn back to Isaiah once we're done. We'll be in the book of Exodus in chapter 14, looking at verse 10. Again, that's Exodus 14, verse 10. Now, as humans, we constantly tend to forget that God can do anything. There are several accounts in the Old Testament where God's people forgot the source of their help was the God that created everything. And we'll consider a few of these accounts together. Now, when we look at the Exodus here in verse 10, we read, As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel, the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness." Now, God's people have just seen amazing signs from God. These signs are the reason Pharaoh allowed them to leave Egypt. God brought powerful plagues. They watched all these miracles happen firsthand. But his army is coming after them, and they become afraid. So this huge army is running towards them. They're in the desert. They have their children with them, and they don't have weapons. But they already forgot that their God can do anything. And Moses reminded them in verse 13. But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. They were ready to run back to Egypt after all their God had done for them. They said it would have been better to stay in slavery than take God's gift of freedom. How often are we running back to Egypt? In our hearts, running back to the bondage, forgetting all that God has done for us. And as we know, Pharaoh's army was destroyed and God brought them the victory. Now, going forward in time, when we look at David and Goliath, and for those who are not familiar, this story is found in 1 Samuel 17. So the Philistines, they had a huge warrior. They had a giant named Goliath, and he challenged Israel's army to a duel. The deal was the loser of the duel would become slaves of the winner. In verse 10, we read, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. 
When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. But David reminded them in verse 37. David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David had no strong armor. He had no big sword or weapons. He fully trusted in God. He remembered all that God had done for him, and he knew that God would be with him right there. He knew that he had nothing to fear because he belonged to God. And he showed God's people that God brings the victory. Now, we're going to look at a time right before Isaiah wrote Isaiah 41. Now, during the ministry of Isaiah the prophet, one of the kings that he served was Hezekiah. At the time of Isaiah's ministry, the Assyrians were in their prime. They were conquering kingdom after kingdom. Now, this account is found in multiple places in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 36. It's also found in 2 Kings 18, as well as 2 Chronicles 32. So the Assyrians invaded Judah and Jerusalem while Isaiah was the prophet. And King Hezekiah, he was so afraid, he took gold from the doors and the doorposts of God's temple. And he gives it to the Assyrian king. And he hopes that this would appease him and he would stop attacking. Well, taking gold from God's temple was an unsuccessful approach, if you can imagine. The Assyrian king continued his attack, and when we look at Isaiah 37, we see Hezekiah was terrified and reached out to Isaiah for counsel. And Isaiah reminded him, through Isaiah, God told Hezekiah the king, do not be afraid. So what happened was, God sent the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrians. And as you can imagine, the Assyrians left them alone after that. There is no biblical record of the Assyrians ever attacking God's people again. Now, as people, we can often forget all that God has done for us. We can find ourselves running back to our old ways, doing what's easy in the moment rather than trusting in him. And when faced with giant problems, we may become fearful and forget to trust in him. When dealing with attacks from our enemies or difficulties in this life, we may try to handle things on our own way or in our own strength, rather than trusting in him. The victory belongs to God in every situation. In the Exodus, the people were afraid when they saw Pharaoh's army coming, and God brought them the victory. When the Philistine giant Goliath was threatening the people, God brought them the victory. And when the Assyrian army was conquering everyone and attacked God's people, God brought them the victory. God shows his people time and time again that he will bring the victory. We still need to be reminded, do not fear. And as we look back at our verse today in Isaiah 41, we see the reasons not to fear. God says in verse 10, for I am with you, for I am your God. And in verse 13, for I am the Lord, your God. Our creator is giving us a personal assurance of his nearness and his involvement in our lives. God is not distant. He is not far off. He is always with us and he loves us. And as we just saw through the Exodus, through David and Goliath, and through the Assyrian attack, our God does not lose. He is always victorious. And when we know that God is with us, and when we know that we are with him, we have his protection, his guidance, and his support. Only 12 times in the Old Testament, God uses this exact wording, I am with you. Now, eight out of the 12 times are found right here in Isaiah and Jeremiah. And in context, God is preparing his people for the Babylonian captivity 
which is soon to come. God's people are about to face 70 years in captivity. And God knows they need the reassurance to stay strong through this time. God tells the people in Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. In 43.5, Do not fear, for I am with you. Then when Jeremiah the prophet begins his ministry, the Babylonian captivity is much closer. So God prepares Jeremiah and then continues to prepare the people. So God prepares Jeremiah by telling him in Jeremiah 1.8, Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. And 119, They will fight against you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you to deliver you. Then God continues to prepare the people in 1520. God says, they will not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and deliver you. And then 3011, God says, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to save you, for I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you. Remember this. And in 4211, God says, do not be afraid of the king of Babylon whom you are now fearing, do not be afraid of him. For I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. And in 4628, God says, do not fear, for I am with you. While Jeremiah was the prophet of God's people, they were taken into captivity. God says, do not fear, I am with you. God tells them to serve the Babylonians and to pray for them in Jeremiah 29, 7. Over a hundred years before this took place, God, through Isaiah the prophet, he told his people about Babylonians' destruction, about Babylon's destruction in Isaiah 13. He prophesied about it a hundred years before it took place. And then a hundred years before this took place, God, through Isaiah the prophet, explained by name, the person who would release his people. In Isaiah 44, 28, the Lord says through Isaiah, It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temples, your foundations will be laid. Over a hundred years later, Cyrus brought God's people out of the Babylonian bondage and continued to destroy the Babylonian empire. Our God is the one who laid the foundations of the earth. He's the one who set the stars in the sky. He's the one who spoke the sun into existence. He is all powerful and all knowing. Our God knows everything you think and everything you do far before it ever happens. If we're honest with ourselves, there are moments when we might not be true to ourselves about why we think or act the way we do. But God understands perfectly our true motives and our true reasons. He knows everything and he is with us. Psalm 46, beginning in verse 1, tells us, God is our refuge. He is our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered, He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Now, we have no idea if we'll be taken into captivity 30 years from now or 50 years from now, but God knows. We have no idea if we'll be facing a war, a depression, a natural disaster, but God knows. No matter what the situation is in this life, we need to know two things. He is God, and he is with us. 
And knowing this, let's remember, he has power over all things. He knows all things. He only wants what is best for us. He will save us, and he will bring us the victory. God tells us, do not fear. God tells us, he is with us. And God promises us, he will help us. Looking at the promises given here in Isaiah 41, we see that God says in verse 10, I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And in verse 11 and 12, those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but you will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. And in verse 13, again, God says, I will help you. God's promises are amazing, aren't they? I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will destroy your enemies and make them as nothing. You will not find them anymore. Has God ever helped you or given you strength in the past? Has God ever helped you to stand through difficulty? We know that God does not promise that all things will be easy. And in Jeremiah's day, as we just saw, the people were taken away from their homes into Babylon for 70 years. Can you imagine your whole family being taken into captivity in an unknown land? These things do happen in this world, and we are not above this happening to us too. This is why we need to know deep in our hearts, this world is not our home. We need to know that he has a plan for us, and we need to know that he will help us. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We'll be in chapter 8. We're beginning in verse 23. Again, that's Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Now, Matthew writes, beginning in verse 23, When Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there, was, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered by the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. He said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, here in Oklahoma, you know all about this severe weather. They were on the boat in the Sea of Galilee. And what happens is, cooler winds sweeping over the hills meet the warmer winds of the Galilean basin. The tornadic effect churns the waters of the sea and causes severe weather. This was no little storm. But Jesus had no trouble sleeping. Through the fierce winds, through the crashing waves, he slept peacefully. And the disciples cried out, save us, we're perishing. Jesus first rebuked them, saying, why are you afraid? Then he told them they had little faith. Now, Jesus did not rebuke them for disturbing them or waking him up and asking for help. Jesus rebuked them for disturbing themselves with their own fears. Imagine this with me. You're in an unpopulated area. You're standing next to God. Everything around you is crashing down through an awesome storm, even the massive destruction of a huge tornado. You're watching all of this crashing down all around you, but you have no fear at all. You know that God is right next to you. You know that he made it all, and he controls it all, and he is protecting you. I would give everything I have in this world for that feeling of absolute, fearless peace. 
And that's the goal, is it not? Because of Jesus' presence, because of his help in our lives, we are safe. Even if they would have died, Jesus would resurrect them. And for those of us who are in Christ, he will resurrect us too. God has an eternal perspective, and we should as well. Our God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Even after this life is over, we are still alive. Where is Moses? Where is Elijah? They're alive right now. And I would argue we're even more alive. Without the influence of Satan, we get to be the purest and the truest form of ourselves. We'll experience life in its fullness as God intended for us in the beginning. That's what we have to look forward to after this fleshly life. But there are billions of people in this world today who do not have this hope. People living in constant fear. People hurting who don't know where to turn for their help. Our enemy is not the bad driver on the road or the person who is rude to us. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. It's not the Russians or the Chinese. It's not the people in prison or the people who do not believe the same way that we do. Our fellow humans are not our enemies. These are souls who are hurting and who are deceived. People who need God's help. If any person still has breath in their lungs, there is hope. Each and every soul is precious and worth more than all the money in the world. That's how God sees us. And that is how we need to see others. There are many who are living through a terrible storm every day of their lives. And Jesus can calm those storms. He can bring the peace that is so desperately needed. And we have God with us to help us help them. God says, do not fear. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will help you. Jesus may not calm every storm in this world, but he will calm the storms in our hearts and help us through anything. As God's people, may we know that he is with us and that he will help us. And may we let others know that he can help them too. And God tells us here in verse 11 and 12, he will make our enemies as nothing. I would say this was true for Isaiah's time, and it is true for us as well. Can anyone point to the modern day Babylonians on a map? The fact is they no longer exist, just as God said. In the world today, in our daily lives, who is our enemy? 1 Peter 5.8 tells us our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. Ephesians 6 tells us we wrestle against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our enemy is Satan and his army. And the time is coming when Satan will be nothing also. Romans 16, 20 tells us, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And Revelations 20 and verse 10, we read, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus has already won the victory. In John 16, Jesus tells us, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. God never said it would be easy, but he did say it would be worth it. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 1 Peter 5.10 We must trust in his promises. Embrace his power through the good and the bad. Trust his promises during the storms of this life. Know that the victory belongs to God in every situation. And know that he will help you. 
What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Romans 8.31. There is no safer place to be than in God's family. And there is no place more dangerous than outside of God's family. This life is not easy, but our God is undefeatable. He always wins. So while we're in this world, while we're building huge cities and space stations and robots, we need to be careful to remember where our creativity and our abilities come from. We cannot afford to fall in love with this world or the things in this world or our achievements and abilities. In scripture, pride is most often used to refer to an unrealistic view of one's own achievements, abilities, or possessions. Pride has been at the heart of our problems since the very beginning. It's the reason Lucifer thought he could be more powerful than God. It's the reason that Eve ate from the fruit and did not obey the commands of God. Pride is the reason the Pharisees could not see who Jesus was. It can make us think we're better than others. Pride can make us believe that we're responsible for the success or the victory. It can stop us from admitting our weaknesses and our faults. It can blind us for the real- from the reality that is right in front of us. Pride can keep us from fully relying on God. Our God loves us, and he never loses. He will take care of us, but he calls us to humility. He calls us to complete surrender, to trust in him. God tells us he is God, and we are not. When we fully surrender to him, we can know that he will bring the victory. When we fully surrender to him, then he is the Lord of our lives and not ourselves. When we fully surrender to him, we have no reason to fear. For those who are in God's family, death has no sting. And thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we bring this lesson to a close, let us remember our God is undefeatable. Remain reliant on him. Give all glory to God always. Reflect on all that he has done and continues to do for you and surrender to him. Be free of fear. Rejoice in who he is. He is our creator and he never loses. He has all power, knows all things, and he loves you. And rest in his promises. Your help comes from him. Your strength comes from him. Your success comes from him. He has already delivered us the victory. We just need to embrace it. If you are in God's family, you have nothing to fear. God is with us, and God will help us. If you have not yet accepted this victory, if you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, now is the time. God calls you to be a part of his family, to trust in his power and to rest in his promises. Come forward, surrender to him, and experience the peace and the victory that only he can provide. If you're not sure of the safety of your soul, or if you need the encouragement or the prayers of the church, please come forward as we stand and sing.